I'm talking about the International Sawfish Encounter Database. I'm going to run through a couple things that, uh, just to get put it in perspective. Um, the, the original listing process in the United States, which began in 1999, uh, involved the development of what was known as the National Sawfish Encounter Database, uh, which was initially uh, housed at the uh, Moat Marine Laboratory under uh, uh, Colin Simpendorfer's care. Um, and later on, when the recovery plan was put into effect in 2007, a big part of that was the, uh, the interest in maintaining and developing uh, the National Sawfish Encounter Database as a source of information. We'll go over why it's important, we think, uh, uh, a little bit later. Um, then, uh, subsequently to that, uh, in 2008, um, that database at Moat uh, was transferred to our institution, the University of Florida, where it was integrated with a series of other databases that had been running uh, prior to and concurrent with that one at Moat. Uh, and uh, so we uh, integrated uh, six databases into one, um, including the Moat Lab one, which Tanya Wiley was overseeing at the time, a couple uh, uh, from the state of Florida, uh, a research and an interview database, and then Matt uh, McDavid's uh, database, uh, my own, and one by Jason Seitz, another uh, sort of sawfish aficionado. Uh, all these went together into forming what it was a na now we called the Unified uh, International Sawfish and Gutter Days, the name change uh, reflective of the fact that we are uh, moving outside of Florida in terms of our interests as well as uh, in the state of Florida and the United States. Why do we record encounters? Uh, they, they're a, a good uh, mechanism to monitor the recovery of the animals. We hope the recovery and not the continued decline. Uh, they help us define uh, critical habitat um, and they're very useful in the technical aspects of environmental planning and permitting uh, because it, it keeps the data together in one place that can be used for those purposes. Um, in the uh, International Sawfish Encounter Database, so here we're sort of merging the two into, into the one, um, the historic uh, encounters were, are, are just as important to us as, as, the, as the new ones. In fact, many ways even more important, uh, simply because they present snapshots in time of what used to be uh, before we screwed it all up around the world. So uh, uh, historic records are very, very important. Um, we get them through uh, museum specimens by looking at material in museums with the, uh, the caveat that uh, everything you see in a museum is not necessarily where it was supposed to have been from. In fact, there's a lot of big problems with accepting museum specimens locations without uh, ground truthing. Uh, we go to newspapers and magazines, archived photos in, 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 uh, in, in museums and so forth, and scientific publications getting these, these records. Um, recent records are gathered, uh, as you might expect, through uh, word of mouth uh, involving telephone uh, interviews, online questionnaires, which we have on our website, uh, emails, uh, and contacts with researchers. So our, our incoming material on, on a day-to-day -day basis is built primarily on folks that either have seen them or caught them in, in, in their fishing activities um, and uh, the activities of researchers involved in actively with the animals at this time. Uh, what type of data do we get? Well, I don't, I don't expect everybody to look at all these things, but suffice it to say that there's a, a broad suite of uh, data activities involving the, the area, the location, the habitats, um, the biological information surrounding the, uh, the actual critters, uh, capture information in terms of gear, who, who did the collecting and so forth, try to get as much information as we can get out, um, and to show you the kind of um, detail that we go on, uh, this is just a, an indication of confidence level that we've developed for the geolocation so that we can uh, add some credibility as to where, where it really came from or where it didn't. And so we have a, a zero to six, with six being the highest ones, um, and uh, a lot of them actually end up falling in the lower, lower ranges because of the uh, uh, paucity of data. Um, currently, as of this week, um, we've got uh, almost 11,000 sawfish records in the database, uh, quite a bit more than what we gave you at the earlier 
time periods. Uh, as you can see, we've added probably another 4,000 since we last talked to you um, from all over the world. Uh, uh, but as you might expect, since this origins were in the United States as a national database, uh, that's the area that, that's particularly well taken care of. You can't read it, but there's almost 5,000 records from Florida alone, which is where the focus, of course, of, of uh, recovery in the United States is in, in that area. Um, what, what, are, what kind of data do, do these provide us? Well, we can look, for instance, in, in uh, 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 where, where they occurred by year. Red are from 1998 onwards, and you can see the reds are basically in Florida. Um, the oldest records in yellow, going through 1959, you can see had spreads all the way up, and as John alluded to in an earlier talk, uh, all these historical records were no doubt uh, summer migrations, movements of the animals up as far as New York, and probably, uh, this is open to debate even within us, uh, our group, uh, I suspect probably most of these in the Gulf of Mexico were coming from Florida and going this way rather than having things come up, although there was probably mixing here in, in uh, Mexico from the south. Um, one of the problems you have is identification, of course. And in the western part of the, of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, historically, there were two species, the large tooth and the small tooth uh, sawfishes. And so if you go back, especially with historic data, anything from this region, unless it had a good photograph of the saw, we can't tell whether it was a large tooth or, or a small tooth. So they simply go in as SPs in those regions until we, or if we can find more info, but so there's almost 200 records from that area that we can't get past Christus uh, and those two species. Um, just as a matter of separation to show you how you can use some of this data, but we're just breaking this up into uh, five uh, geographic regions. We call this North Atlantic, Southeast Atlantic, the Keys, the Florida Keys, the Southwest Gulf, and the Northern Gulf. And by looking at, um, uh, in this case here, numbers of individuals versus uh, size classes, um, we can see that, uh, that we've got uh, um, the, the juveniles, the little guys, the ones that uh, Colin and his group were studying uh, primarily and John's now working on, um, are found in the uh, uh, southwestern Gulf. And the ones in the northern Gulf tended to be that way as well historically were the, the smaller ones. So this is generally the nursery area sort of situation. Then as you got down to the Keys in the South Atlantic and eventually to the North Atlantic, you begin to see larger ones uh, moving into that area. So the, the southwestern gulf is the, is the primary nursery area. Then the juveniles and sub-adults eventually turn into the adults into the uh, areas to the south. And then uh, those that went up into northern part, oh my god, two minutes, uh, were uh, 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 primarily the adults moving forward. Uh, these would be the sub-adults to adults range. Um, we look at it by depth, the same kind of situation. Um, the very small juveniles are found in the shallowest waters, and as they become uh, sub-adults and adults, they begin to move into deeper water. Uh, just looking at, at, uh, at, at how our, our, our uh, database has grown through uh, interview data, just interview data, no research records, you can see there's been a, a gradual rise as we hopefully are getting the word out and, and people are getting back to us uh, uh, better each year. Uh, to be truthful, 2010, I didn't, we didn't get, put all that in there, but there was a drop in 2010 and a little bit in 2011. And we're getting some pushback uh, from certain uh, fishermen in, in Florida who are concerned that we're knowing too much about sawfish now and that we might put them out of business. Um, so we, we're having to fight that battle. Um, we also can find out why fishes died and how they died. Uh, this, again, this is just for a two-year period. In 2009, we had a couple of dead ones, no saws, which indicated they had been met their fate with uh, a fisherman one way or the other. And then a series of, of them that died in the winter of 2010 when there was a big cold uh, front came through and there was natural mortality associated with this cold event. Um, again, how, how we can do certain things, we can tell the type of activity where the interactions are occurring and in fact 
what you get is the recreational fishery is the is the uh, uh, the main hitter of, of sawfish in, in in this area, um, and then uh, the research folks are allowed to touch so many of them, and then actually commercial fishing is pretty low compared to uh, uh, other things. Now to really get this kind of information, whether it be in the United States or anywhere else, we have to reach out and, and educate people to let them know that we want to know about it. And to do that, we have uh, uh, done a number of initiatives. One is to have a, a big internet website which, uh, where people can report about these things. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, direct contact, actually making, reaching out to organizations and to, to groups of people. Media interviews, I do a lot of media work. Workshops, we have uh, workshops for teachers about sawfish. And then of course regular oral presentations to researchers and the general public. The internet site, uh, which you can, I'd be happy to give you that address at another time, has all these various sections including bio profiles of each species, uh, the database, how to, how to uh, put sawfish encounters in, why they're in trouble and so forth. I know, stop soon. Uh, direct contact, we literally reach out to, to people in, in all the time every year. Uh, Part of the direct contact is through people who have reported their, their, their uh, uh, interactions. They become disciples. In fact, anybody who finds one just falls in love. And so then we use them to send out brochures and put up signs in their area, and they're very happy to do that. Um, we have signs like these on every uh, launching ramp in South Florida uh, so that people see it when they come and go. Metal Science tells you all about the, uh, how to release the, the animal in, in a good condition. Um, South Florida for us is a bilingual area where there's Spanish and English both being spoken. So we have all of our stuff done in, in two languages right now. And on our website we have uh, uh, stuff in four languages. We have French and Portuguese as well. Direct involvement and in, in so forth. Uh, let's skip through this stuff that I forget here. Uh, media interviews, every time we get media interviews, we get an increase in the number of reports that come in. So again, it's keeping the public aware of what's going on and why we, we do it. The workshops, we, we work with environmental educators, uh, work for the kids, we try to turn it around with them. Uh, blah, 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 the same sort of thing, presentations at, at meetings. Now. I want to thank everybody, this is important. Uh, these are folks that, that uh, have done the most to, to, to make this happen. Uh, John and his folks, his helpers, uh, uh, the folks at Moat, um, Colin and Tanya, uh, and Greg Polakis from FWC. So these are the people that have put in the most. Matt McDavid shared his database with us. We certainly want to know more about it. And just because I got you for another 30 seconds, um, I want to let you know that we're also doing uh, uh, tagging of adult stuff that, uh, that uh, uh, John mentioned. Uh, we got uh, 11 uh, adults overboard this last two months. Um, here's a quick active track on one that we did in South Florida demonstrating some uh, nighttime affinity for seagrass beds. Um, and we're launching a, an independent funding fundraising event uh, because money is tight. And so we've started a Save the Sawfish campaign, which is going to happen uh, in, in the next week or so. And that's going to be uh, in Daytona. And Guy Harvey, right here, uh, the artist uh, is part of that. And um, we're having a big gala to try to raise some funds for sawfish. Thank you very much. Thank you.